My name is Lisa Mangum. Uh, by day, I am managing editor of Shadow Mountain Publishing. It's the national market imprint for Deseret Book. I've been there 20 plus years. Um, so I love fiction. I love editing it and I love reading it. I also love writing it. So by night, I write young adult romance and adult contemporary romance and some short fiction. Weekends, I am obsessed with Supernatural. So come to my class tomorrow on writing tips from Supernatural. Shameless plug. Hi, I'm Dan Willis, and I've known you a long time. I did not know you were editor of Shadow Mountain. How did I not know that? Well, probably because I have an ADD like a puppy, and it probably came up when something shiny happened. Uh, I'm Dan Willis. I uh, have written for Wizards of the Coast back in the day for their Dragonlance brand, and more recently I am publishing a series of uh, diesel punk noir mysteries called The Arcane Casebook, which you can get out at Amazon, and uh, that's me. Okay, I'm Wendy Knight, and I write mostly young adult urban fantasy. I have a pen, night, pen name that writes romance, but we don't talk about that. It's a secret. Um, and that's all, right? Is that good? Okay. That's good. My name is Mary Robinette Kowal. I'm a science fiction and fantasy author. I'm probably best known for um, either the Lady Astronaut series or the Glamorous Histories. So it's either Jane Austen with Magic or Ladies in Space. Um, and then I'm also a professional puppeteer and an audiobook narrator and a member of the Writing Excuses podcast. I'm Gamma Martinez. I write um, upper middle grade lower YA fantasy. My big series is A Faramore, which is a seven book series about angels. And then I have a space elf series uh, called The Goblin Star. Okay, since this is about outlining, we will just maybe just talk about what systems we use to outline. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying I don't outline. <laughs> so <laughs> this would be interesting. Um, I do, I, I mean, I, I guess I kind of outline because I daydream the whole story in my head first, and then I write down everything I can remember, and that's my outline. So I'm not sure how helpful that is, but that's what I do. I, I think that's incredibly helpful. That's that's the way I think most of us work to some degree or another. The the thing that I find with outlining is that people have an idea of what outlining is that is based on elementary school or high school where you had to outline your paper and turn in the outline for the teacher. And I want to be clear that when we're talking, I am talking at least, about outlining, that, that there are two different types of outlines. There's the selling outline, which is the thing that has to make sense to other people. And then there's the writing outline, which is the thing that has to make sense to you. And with a writing outline, it, it doesn't need to follow any particular format. It's just there as a tool to help you hold all of the pieces of the story in your head that you're afraid you're going to forget. And so if all you need is, uh, like I have a, in one of my outlines, an entire chapter just says, sailing, exclamation point. Um, in my current outline, I have a chapter, the entirety of it is, phew, exclamation point. There's a theme here. Um, other ones I have like very, very detailed. So it's just, it is a tool for you. Uh, I use a method called the Hollywood formula, which is something I learned from uh, uh, Lou Anders, who was used to be the editor of Pyre. Uh, he actually gave me my first personal rejection, so that was nice. Uh, it's essentially something based off of screenwriting, and it, it analyzed, uh, the way he taught it is he analyzed a lot of movies and said, okay, this is the break between act one and two, this is the break between act two and three, this is the inciting, this is a climax. I put in all those points and then I built around those. Um, I do a little bit of the same thing, um, where uh, years ago when my mom taught me how to plot, I, I used, I think it's Freitag's Pyramid that's skewed to the right, so it's your um, inciting incident, you have your three main plot turns, um, your rising action, the dark moment, the climax, and the denouement, and I'll, I'll, to this day when I'm like, ooh, I think I want to, I've got a story that feels like it's going to come out, like what should I do, and I draw that little triangle, with that little um, pyramid, and I draw my little marks, and I just fill in those seven points as my as my guideposts for what am I aiming for, what am I going to shoot for? Because I know the story is going to meander and change a little bit along the way, but if I at least have those um, milestones in sight, I feel a lot more confident and comfortable starting my book. 
because I edit full time, I have, my free time for writing is very limited and I hoard those minutes um, like a dragon <laughs> because I only have so many of them. So I outline obsessively and then I draft once because I don't have time to write 80,000 words of which I will only keep 10,000 and then do it again. I have time to write 80,000 words. Um, so I find outlining really, really helpful. And I love what you said about getting your mind, like keeping all of those elements in your mind at the same time. Um, the way I always thought about it is I want to get my arms around the story. Can I, can I sit down and get my arms all the way around the story so I know start to finish what that arc looks like? And that's kind of how I keep it all together. I go back to those seven main points over and over again. And then I start filling in, well, like, here's a chapter that will require this. And here's a chapter where I need to go sailing. And here's a chapter where they kiss. And sometimes it's just that small. But having that structure in place anchors me so I don't feel lost when I'm stuck in the middle of that murky middle of the book. Well, I write mysteries. So I have to outline. Um, sure. There is uh, the first book I ever wrote. I, I just sat down and wrote it. It's a terrible mess. Uh, I, I I want you all. Really? Okay. Uh, I said, anytime I shift my fingers on this, it does sounds like a patting the microphone. Uh, I, I want you to give yourselves permission to outline because a lot of people think, well, a real writer would do that. They just sit down, right? Let me tell you a little story. Uh, this story is about a guy named Michael Eisner, who you may have heard of. He took over Disney in the, I want to say, 80s. And uh, if you remember, any of you who are old like me, uh, will remember that Disney in the 70s was nothing to write home about. They couldn't produce a good movie to save their lives. And uh, when Eisner took over, he went and looked at their animation uh, studio, and they weren't using shooting scripts. And this was insane to him. How do you make a movie without a shooting script? which is an outline, for those of you who don't know what a shooting script is. And uh, he was talking to Roy, uh, Walt's nephew, at a party once, and Roy was telling a story about when Uncle Walt came over, and Roy was like, can, can Uncle Walt put me to bed? Because Uncle Walt told the best stories, as you might imagine. And uh, Uncle Walt put him to bed and sat down and told him a story, and the story he told him was Pinocchio. And uh, Roy remembered very vividly how old he was, and uh, Michael Eisner did the math and realized this was before Pinocchio was made wasn't even in production yet. And he realized Walt had the entire story, every beat, in his head. That's the kind of genius that Walt Disney was. Some of you might be that kind of genius, but I'm going to bet not. <laughs> it's okay to outline. Uh, it's okay to put your story down and work it out. And quite frankly, if you're going to spend the time to write a novel, you know, don't waste that time. Figure it out ahead of time so that your, your time is put to good use. Sorry, I rambled. There were shiny things. I will say um, that I, I've never really been big at outlining until I just started this new series, and it has a super rapid release, so I don't have time to mess around. And so I outlined the whole, well, my outline, so I daydream the whole series. And knowing how the whole thing is going to go, is so awesome because then I can put like little Easter eggs and stuff in the first book that can come back in the last book. And none of the other series that I've ever written have been like that. I've always just been like continuing the story, but there were no little Easter eggs in the first unless I, I didn't, let's just say I didn't. Um, so I think that's too a, a good thing for outlining because then you have the forethought that you don't necessarily have if you're just panting. And if you have like mysteries, it's kind of important. So, um, next question, I think, is, uh, oh, how much detail do you put into your outlines? Um, I, it varies book to book. That was the thing that I learned in writing a trilogy in a very short amount of time. My Hourglass Door trilogy, I did and came out in three, you know, three consecutive years, so I, as soon as I turned in book one, I had to write book two, I had to write book three. And when I got to for book one, I outlined in um, longhand, I wrote chapter one, meet Abby, she's our main character, and I wrote everything that I could possibly think of that I would need, and I went through all 30 chapters that way, and that was my outline that I used, and it changed pretty dramatically halfway through, as outlines tend to do. So when I came, it came time to outline book two, I'm like, I know how to do this, and I wrote chapter one, 
and nothing happened. And I, and I realized chapter two didn't want to play by the same rule. Book two didn't want to play by the same rules that book one did. And I had to come up with a different way of outlining the story. And in that way, I used, um, I'm sure you've probably, some of you, how many of you like use your post-it notes and like put them up on the wall and then move them around? That's what I did. I got my index cards out. I wrote stuff down. I sat on the floor. I moved everything around until I, I felt like I had a pacing I could work with. So by the time book three rolled around, I'm like, I know how this works. I've done it twice before. And I got my index cards out, and book three was like, screw you and the horse you came in on. <laughs> but what, this used to work, and it didn't work. So I said, fine, I'll do what I did for book one. And that didn't work either. And I realized very quickly, well, maybe not quickly enough, that it's okay to change your outlining method depending on what book you were doing it because what worked for one book might not actually work for another one and that is okay. Don't force yourself to use a system that just isn't working. If it's not helping you produce an outline, if it's not helping you produce pages and words, find a different way to outline, find a different method to use. There's a lot of different methods to use and there's a lot of different depending on how much detail you want to put in there. For me, I tend to still do a lot of detail so that I have a shopping list of what my scene, every single scene, every single emotion, every single um, point that I want to make in my chapter, I want to know ahead of time so that when I sit down to write, I'm like, check, 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 did it, moving on to the next chapter. I once wrote a, an 80-page outline for a book that was only 70,000 words. Um, admittedly, it's one of my first books. I really didn't want to screw it up because I was being paid to write it. Uh, but what I found, I'm, I'm working on a book right now that uh, I have, I think, five or six paragraphs of outline for one scene in one chapter because it's a lot of politics. And the main villain, this deliciously evil, evil gal, is uh, scheming. And she's setting the, the, the hero and uh, some of the other people up to be fall guys, and she's got all these plans, and I need to know what those plans are. And so I wrote it all out, and how she's manipulating the other people on this council that she's on, and all these, and all the political infighting, because if I don't know that, it won't come across on the page, and certainly the reader will never figure it out. Why did she do that? And if you don't know what the villain's motivations are, you're really gonna be lost. Later on, uh, one of the heroes of the story is made general of this army that's made up of a bunch of forces from a bunch of different nations, and the paragraph says, he whips them into shape. That's going to be about three chapters. You outline what you need to outline. I don't need, to, I don't need the, training mon the 1980s training montage to be outlined. I can do that in my sleep. But the political stuff I have to get right or the rest of the story will make any sense. And for mine, since I'm writing down what I remember, sometimes it's super detailed, like down to what exactly my characters are going to say to each other to move the story forward. And sometimes it's so vague. So... I think that um, it just depends on what you remember and, and what's important to the story, and that's what's going to make it into your outline. One of the things that I, uh, we're, I think we're all saying the same thing, is that it, it varies a lot. Um, and I, I want to kind of give you a, a little bit of a metaphor for, for how to think of this. Um, I think of outlining as a roadmap. So when I am driving, we, my husband and I live in Chicago, my parents live in Chattanooga. When I'm driving from Chicago to Chattanooga, the first couple of times we did that drive, you know, we, we, needed, we needed the map, right? Uh, and the map is there to tell us how to handle things that we didn't anticipate. Like, even with a, a familiar drive, at one point we're driving, and Indianapolis had torn up all of I-65 without detour signs. Thank you, Indianapolis. So what, what a roadmap does for me is it allows me to, to root around the problem, right? Um, I can get off the road and very quickly find my way back to it. Whereas without it, what tends to happen is I'll get off and be like, uh, so I'll try driving down this road. No, that didn't get me there. I'll try driving down this road. That didn't get me there. I'll try driving down this road. That didn't get me there. And eventually I will figure out how to get there. Um, with the map, it's, it's much faster. It saves time. So you just need the details, but like, I didn't need a map of California to get from Chicago to Chattanooga, because I was going nowhere near California. I just needed those details about the spaces in between. And it's okay to change your mind about where you're going as well, which is the other thing that I think a lot of people who are afraid of outlining get into is that you, you feel like you are locked in once you've committed it to paper. 
So when we're talking about how much detail you need, how much detail do you need to drive a place? And it's, if it's an unfamiliar place, you're going to need more detail. If it's a complicated place, you're going to need more detail. If it's a familiar place, if it's a place that you're comfortable with, if it's a place that's clearly signposted, you will need less detail. I find I'm more systematic about it than a lot of writers. I have one or two sentences per plot point. I assume that each plot point is going to take a thousand words. Uh, my NaNoWriMo outlines are 50 points, are 50 points. Act 1 ends at point 12, Act 2 midpoint is at 25, Act 3 starts at 38, and I do it that way, but that works for me. So, you know, don't feel like, like I was saying, don't feel like you have to be locked into something like that. I am, you know, crazy like that. <laughs> And I think, I'm just going to mention really quick, I think a lot of people are afraid of outlining just because they feel like it curbs their creativity. And it doesn't have to be so detailed that you can't bear off. Like she was saying with the map, um, it does waste a lot of time to go down all those different detours, but you get to see so many cool things. And so when you're outlining, you might feel like you're stuck on one path, but um, you're really not. You, you can alternate it alternate it, you can alter it, and um, I mean, just because you wrote it down doesn't mean that your your outline is set in stone, you can change it, just, you know, in case you didn't realize. So, um, are there any questions so far, or should we keep going? Yeah. What, what techniques do you use to, like, keep the character in mind as you're outlining, so that they still have the ability to, like, drive the story and change it, and you're not like, okay, character has to do this, and you're, you're controlling the character? So the question was, what techniques do we use to, uh, to, to keep kind of the char our, our character arc on track? Uh, one of the things that I do is that I will write up at the top, um, this, is, this is kind of my character arc. And I, I don't necessarily plot out my character arc. Uh, and that's the way that I write. Uh, the character arc is something that I can, I can usually intuitively feel. Uh, when I am stuck on something, when I, I'm um, not getting traction, uh, then I go to a technique that's called dream, um, uh, in which a character arc is defined by, by five points. Uh, denial, oh boy, um, <clears throat> dream, a denial, resistance, uh, exploration, acceptance, and manifestation. And what this means is that when a, a basic character arc is, your character has to go through change. Okay. And I will say that I do not think that every character needs to go through change in every book. Uh, most mystery novels, the character does not undergo change and it's just fine. Um, but if you've got a character arc... Can you, uh, can you give me one of those... Yep, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Denial, uh, your character is like... Uh, so I'll use a romance structure. Denial is like... Who would ever find that guy attractive? Ha, pet, pet. That's denial. Then resistance. Well, I see why some people might find him attractive. I mean, that one thing he did was cute, but whatever. So you resist the idea. Then you explore it. Well, okay, maybe one date. And then you accept, oh no, I'm in love with him. And then you have manifestation, which in a romance structure is actually matrimony. But you can do that same structure with anything. It's like... I'm not an asshole. Okay, well, maybe that one thing I did was jerky. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try apologizing. Oh, no, I am an asshole. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take some anger management classes. Um, or give to the poor, here, puppy. So, um, so what, what I will do when I'm, I'm having trouble getting traction on something is that I will lay out my, uh, my character arc linear, timeline of where they're hitting each of those points. And then I will lay out, say, my event arc linear timeline of when each of those points are happening. And then I will braid them together. What are other people's techniques? I don't generally outline the character arc, but what I do is, generally my story center on, you know, maybe two or three very important characters. And they're all, wild. they're all pretty different from each other. I'll do my outline as these are the things that need to happen for the story to move forward. And then I look at each point, okay, who is the one who needs to, you know, push this plot point forward? Who is the one that it makes most sense? So that allows me to, you know, push the story along, but still remaining true to the characters because each one is doing what they're built to do.
Uh, for me, I do write mysteries. As Mary pointed out, your, your detectives tend not to change much, in, especially in a series. Uh, the mystery is the impetus to drive the plot forward, and solving it is the, the reward. But if you want to, to really keep a handle on your characters, what they're doing and why, you need to answer two questions. One, what is your character's external motivation? What do they say they want? If you know that, how they act in any given situation will kind of be self-evident, unless it's in conflict with their internal motivation, which is what they really want that they don't say they want. Uh, if you want to know how these work, go to your movie shelf, pull any musical. In the first 10 minutes of any musical, the main character will sing a song about what they want. Okay? Uh, everybody in The Little Mermaid? What's the song? Part of your world. What does she want? To be human. Is that what she really wants? Does she face the sea witch in the end because she wants to be human? No. What's her internal motivation? She wants love. Yeah. So. Once you, know, once you know what those two things are about your character, you'll know how they're going to respond in pretty much any situation. Uh, which brings me to one other thing. If you're writing a series, you're going to want to start a series Bible. Uh, when I write, I have a note app open right next to me. And anytime that my character uses a rune that I've never described, well, I describe it. It's shaped like this, and it's this color, and it's made of these materials. These are just details I put in the story, and I make them up as I go. The problem with that is, is three books down the road when he cast the same rune, what did that rune look like? I have no idea. Well, I do now because I write those things down. You know, this character who was a bit player in this prequel book suddenly becomes an important character in book three. What did he look like? Write that stuff down to see if you an awful lot of digging. And add those motivations to it. You'll remember what those characters are like and what they do and what they want. Just by reading them, you'll be ready to go. Um, all, the, all the wisdom. It's just awesome. Um, I think part of, I hope what you're hearing is that this is a great way to approach outlining, is by asking what's my character's motivation? What is it that they really want? At what point in the story do they get it, do they not get it? Even in just answering those questions, you are building your bare bones of an outline. Um, like Mary said, or some, somebody said at the beginning, it's, this is not your you know, your your outline A, or outline 1A, double, double 1, double A, point 2. Like it's not that kind of, necessarily that kind of outline we're talking about. We're talking about building the spine of your book so that you know where to apply pressure to change your characters, to change the events, to drive the story forward. And if you're, if you don't know how to approach outlining, if you're looking at that blank, blank page and you're like, I don't, I don't even know how to start outlining, asking that question, what is it my character wants? What is it that they really want? At what point in the story are they going to get it or be denied? We'll start you on that path. I love that too because when I was doing research for this, because I don't outline, so I was like researching so bad. Um, anyway, there's one, there's actually a theory that you start in the middle of your book when the character is looking in the mirror and they realize who, who they actually are. <laughs> I just lost my whole train of thought. Um, but and then you build, whoa, and then you build around it. So, um, holy crap! Uh, no, I, I think that this is a this is a great point. Thank you. Got it. Would you like this? <laughs> 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 and, 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 and jump back in when you when you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the point that you're making that that we think about outlining as a linear thing, and it doesn't have to be. You can start in the middle and work your way out. Uh, you can start at the end and work your way backwards. That it, it's not, there is not a one size fits all. Yeah, and then you know your character, you know what your character is after, was my point. Um, along that line of starting in the middle and growing out, or starting in a different place and growing out, the snowflake method is a great way as well for outlining um, it, it has a series of questions that you follow, and in answering those questions, it will help build um, from a, a, a very large concept to getting more and more detail, more and more detail, more and more detail, and, and building building your story outward um, by identifying those details. And it's just, if you Google the Snowflake method, you will find it. It's everywhere on the internet. It's a very It might be a very handy system for you to use. Um, it's also a really handy way to write a synopsis of your book. Which, when you are done with your book, 
you will need to do if you want to submit it for publication. An editor and agent will ask you for a summary of your book, and you need to be able to provide the outline. That's what you mentioned before, the, the selling outline. You have to be able to explain what your book is about in a very short amount of time. And the, your outline, your summary is not going to be, okay, it starts in chapter one, and there's a girl in the forest, and it's dark, and there's a monster chasing her, and there's a storm coming. Okay, and then she comes across the hut, and I'm like, yeah, no, we're never going to get through the book at this point. I need to know, like, what is your book about? And if you are serious about writing it all, you're going, I'm sorry, it's going to sound painful. You're going to have to learn how to do that. You're going to have to learn how to write a synopsis of your book in one page. And if you already have an outline, if you are not afraid of your outline, that will help you write that synopsis at the end. The other benefit of that is once you are under contract or once you have a publisher, they might ask you for a synopsis of your book before you have written it. Because we're going through this right now. Our, our sales catalog, we're getting ready to announce, you know, to promote our Fall 19 line. Some of those books that are coming out at the end of our Fall 19 line, the author is still working on that manuscript, which is fine. She's not behind schedule in terms of getting the book out. But I need to know how it ends. I need to know, like, what the book is about so I can, so that marketing and sales can sell the book. And so I, I'm like, Wendy, you got to write me a synopsis of your book that isn't done yet. And that is a really valuable skill in working with an editor and working with a publisher that um, can grow out of your skill in outlining. Yeah, I hate to second that, but it, it's it's such and it's it's oh geez, what a horrible thing to do. I know. Uh, and try to you will hate it, and that is oh fine. yeah. Yeah, and own it. The point is, is, it's one of those things, if you want to be a writer, you've got to have to get good at it. Even if you're self-published, you're going to have to, on your Amazon page, you're going to have to put a very brief synopsis that makes people want to buy your book. What is this book about? It's a little bit more like an elevator pitch, but it's the same idea. If you have to be able to condense the idea down. And uh, I don't know how that relates to outlining so much other than outlines. You work backwards. Uh, so, oh, Snowflake Method, that's what yeah, you're talking about. Method. Yeah, okay, that makes much more sense. But yeah, that, I just wanted to second that, because that's one of those skills that... I constantly regret not being better at. <laughs> okay, are there more questions? Because I saw one over here a while ago. Yeah. I was just going to ask, when when your story changes partway through, do you re-outline the rest of that? And has that ever happened, say, when it's already been marketed? When the story changes, so the question is, when your story changes halfway through, do you change the outline? And has that ever happened when the story has already been marketed? Um, yes, you do change the outline. Um, and yes, I'm sure it has happened. Yeah, you were nodding. Yes. Um, yes, that, I mean, that's kind of the, the risk that you, that you run when you're like, I'm going to tell everybody about this awesome book that doesn't exist yet, except in the mind of the author, and surprise, it kind of changes at the end. Um, and that's okay, because it, to a certain extent, it's okay. I don't want to be like, it's fine, don't worry about it, because we do worry about it a little bit. But at the same time, the buyers down the row in, in the industry also understand that what they're reading is first stab at what the book is about. And just like the advanced reading copies, it's an uncorrected proof. There could be things in an ARC that don't end up in the finished book. Um, and that's okay. They understand that. So they're, they're not going to come back to us and say, you, you sold us the wrong kind of book because some of the details are different. Or that it turned out, the killer turned out to be somebody else. Well, as long as somebody dies in the mystery and the detective solves it, that's probably okay. Um, and so there's some, there's some give on that. Um, so don't panic too much, um, and that and your editor and your publisher can help walk you through that. You don't have to like assume the worry of that at this point. And for me, um, in Hourglass Door, halfway through, I made a, a really substantial change to one of my characters, which was awesome, which was perfect, which made the book better, and which totally negated the second half of the outline. And I'm like. That's okay, because what I have now is way better. And it was easy to walk away from this good idea that I had because I'd found something better. I didn't, at that point, oddly enough, re-outline the second half of the book because I saw it so clearly. I didn't have to write down, and then this happens, and then this happens. I'm just like, I'm writing it. I know what happens. Because it had crystallized so vividly in my head that I didn't have to go back. Uh, that was a really interesting experience for me. It hasn't happened 
it hasn't happened since where it changed, my outline changed so dramatically for the better. I always have one major point that is not in my outline that shows up in my book, and there's always one major point in my outline that does not make it into the book. Um, I talked about a little bit how I outline, and because of how, I guess, kind of meticulous I am, I try to figure, okay, this is a departure, how do I get back to it down the road? But I don't try to get right back to it, I try to make it flow organically, but I try to get back to the original outline eventually. Honestly, I don't think I've ever had an experience where I've gotten in the middle of the book and had a revelation of that magnitude. Uh, I have done things where I'm like, oh wow, if this character's mother died when he was young, that would totally explain this, this, and this, and I'll go back and retcon it two chapters earlier with like one sentence, because I'm a writer, ergo I'm lazy. But uh, uh, if, I, I, and a lot of times I'll, you know, ooh, this is much better, this changes who the killer is, eh, I haven't gotten to that point yet, and I'll just fix it going forward. But, uh, but if I ever got into a situation, I think, where I'm like, okay, I can see how I was totally wrong. Now, the whole point of outlining is not to get to that point, but that doesn't mean you never will. Uh, actually, it hasn't happened to me, but I don't discount it. Uh, if it ever did happen, I, I, I'd rewrite the rest of the outline. If you're going to make a better book, that's what you need to do. A lot of times, well, I'll have really good ideas. Ooh, wouldn't it be great if you know sorcerers could do this, and that meant that you could combine this magic with it? You start doing uh, calculus on magic. I write that in that notes window I had open. I, I open a new tab and I'm like, this is for the next book. And it's going to be awesome. And by the time I get finished with the first book, or whatever book I'm writing, and I'm getting ready to go on to the next one, I'm already excited. Because I've got good ideas. So yeah, don't be afraid of that stuff. You know, it, writing is a fluid process. OK, so in the clear back. I just want, you were talking about how when you, with the dream method, when you get stuck, you take your character arm and you figure out where those five, they then is manifestation right? Manifestation. You figure out where those five are on the character arc, and then you mentioned something about the event arc. That was a part I missed. How do you, what do you do to, to reconcile with it? Right, okay, so, uh, so an event arc is uh, like when something has disrupted the status quo and your character is trying to write the status quo. Um, so you can do, like you can use any plot structure you want, whether it's a seven point plot structure. Um, I did uh, Valor and Vanity, which is basically Jane Austen writes Ocean's Eleven. It's a heist novel, so I used a heist structure. And which, what I do, and this is what I do, and this is, this is something I just really, really wanna make sure that you all are all hearing. We all have different methods for every book, so none of this is you must do this. What I do, what works for me, is that I work out a linear timeline of how my character gets from point A to point Z. And then, uh, and then I figure out which of those are actually going to be on the page. Because not every, like, I don't actually need to see them travel from place to place or sleep or, or fart. Sometimes fart because it's funny. But <laughs> the, the, I, I use, like, I will often use uh, the seven-point plot structure, um, and I'll, I'll figure out my linear timeline of... Mm, sorry, I'm explaining this badly. What I do first, actually, before I get to that point, uh, is I use uh, the, the mice quotient, which is an organizational theory. How many people were in the... Um, in, in the previous thing where I talked about it, not enough of you for me to skip it. Okay, the mice quotient is an organizational structure, or organizational theory, that every story is made of four elements, milieu, inquiry, character, and event. And uh, that what happens is with an event story, an event story begins when the status quo is disrupted, and it ends when the status quo has been restored or there is a new status quo. So all of the conflicts in the middle are things that are preventing your character from restoring the status quo. So knowing that, what I do is say, okay, my character is going to spend most of their time restoring the status quo, so this is, this is where I start, this is where I end. What are the steps that they have to take to get me there? That tells me the linear timeline. The seven-point plot structure tells me how to pace delivering that to the reader. Does that make sense? 
So what I do then is work out that, and then I try to put those two things together by, I say, braiding them. Um, and what I'm looking for when I'm braiding, so I've got a character and, a, and an event thing. And what I'm looking for are places where those things can intersect. Because a, a straight event story is predictable. A straight character story is very predictable. You know, a, a character story that begins with, I'm wearing glasses, I'm not popular. Oh, I've taken my glasses off, now I am popular. I mean, you know, first of all, that's annoying. But second, <laughs> you, can, you can see that coming a mile away. Having the intersection, those intersections where the storylines cross each other is where it gets interesting. And so that's what I'm looking for, is where the, uh, the event can, can make my character, uh, can push my character story. I'm looking at places where the character story can push the event story and twist it in ways that I, uh, the reader may not have anticipated. So that's, that's what I'm looking for when I break those two things together. In an ideal world, I'm kind of hitting both things in every scene to some degree, keeping them alive and, and moving. But, um, but I'm at least cognizant of them and, and aware of where they need to be. Okay, any more questions? Oh, hang on. I'd like to take a whack at that. Uh, I like that you, uh, you pointed out that you used a heist structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those of you uh, not familiar with this, every different kind of plot is built a little differently. There's a book called 20 Master Plots, I forget who wrote it, but it's 20 Master Plots, go to Google or Amazon. Uh, and it's real good about describing the basic, breaking those plots down into some very basic elements that you can then use to paste into a story, and you can mix and match too. It's really got, it's a very cool thing to do. Uh, when I write a mystery, you know, a mystery is actually pretty simple. You have something that happened, and a guy who's going to figure it out. And so when I write a mystery, it's very simple. I got the inciting incident, the first clue, the second clue, the third clue, the red herring, the reveal, and the datum. That's it. You know, every time the character gets a clue, that's information he can use to get new suspects and do new lines of inquiry. So it's not every little detail. It's a major detail. I can go through that outline a dozen times, come up with a dozen different plots, shuffle them together, and create a, a mystery story that will bend your brain. I usually only use three, because if you use ten, it would be really, really confusing. Uh, but I do that because that's a good structure for mystery. If you're writing romance or fantasy or uh, urban fantasy, any of these other things, there are structures that will, uh, if you follow them because they're kind of standard, will let your reader feel like they're in the right place. Uh, sometimes when you write uh, an outline, you, you know, you're writing a heist, but it's not in a heist format, you get a little lost in the middle because you're not sure what you're reading. You know, obviously, don't be too slavish to this, but it's an important thing to know. It's, it's like knowing tropes. You know, you, you need to know what's what the ground is that you're writing on. Anything else? Uh, I just I just wanted to make sure I got this in before because I know we're run, running out of time a little bit. Um, if you don't know what method will work best for you, like we've talked about, like following the tropes and following the, the expected pattern of your chosen genre, because as readers we expect certain things to happen at certain times. The, the familiarity and predictability sometimes is why we like to read genre fiction. But we've talked a little bit about the snowflake method and about um, plotting your arcs and a few other things. I just wanted to make sure that some of the other things that you might want to research that might help you in outlining your story um, understanding the hero's journey structure is a great one to do. The Hollywood, um, the Hollywood formula is a great one to do. Uh, the three act structure is a great one. And um, at Superstars, the Superstars conference last week, um, Kevin Eikenberry talked uh, talked a lot about different kinds of plot structures, and he um, mentioned a program that he uses called Contour. Um, which is takes some of those um, overlapping. Um, elements that are pretty standard and you fill in the little box it gives you the prompt of like what this is what should be happening at this point in your story what does that look like in your book and you write down well this is what it looks like in my book and it's a way to help organize your thoughts and a way to make sure that you're hitting those kinds of beats for the particular kind of story that you were writing. So if you are interested you might want to do some research on that program it's not very expensive and it might be a great way to if you're new to outlining to have some a program guide you through the kinds of questions to think about your book. What was that um, called? It's called Contour. 
Um, I haven't used it yet. I'm super fascinated by it, though. And so, um, because I love to outline and to love that kind of plot, that plot work. So that those might be some good places to start your journey to find out what works best for you. Save the Cat, obviously, is another great one. It's for screenplays, but it's the same. Looking at your story, finding those beats, finding the pattern and the rhythm of how you personally tell a story. I just want to make sure some of those names got out there so you can write them down and do your homework. Quick, quick note. I just found out like two days ago. Apparently, Save the Cat now has a novel. Yes, Save the Cat writes. I think it's Save the Cat writes a novel. I think is what it's something, called. Something like that. Um, so they do have the version of Save the Cat that is geared for screenplay, and now they have a version of Save the Cat that's geared for specifically for novels. And um, again, those would be great resources. Um, the other book that Kevin had mentioned is called My Story Can Beat Up Your Story, which I. I'm also super fascinated by and will order on Amazon because it's that same kind of walking you through how to think about your story from a very high level. Okay, really quick, we have three minutes. Are there more questions? Um, do you ever have other people look at your outlines and help you with your outlines? And if you do, how can you make that uh, most effective for you as a writer? Yes. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I do absolutely have other people look at my outlines. Um, uh, my editor or agent will look at it very early on, writer's group, uh, friends, um, and it depends on, on how I'm, I'm stuck. What I usually, I go to people who ask me the right questions. Um, and those questions are basically why, how, and with what effect. Uh, and uh, my husband is great because he, he's very good about me suddenly talking about a novel that he has not read anything of, and he just asks me the right questions, and sometimes the right question is, do you want to go for a walk? <laughs> and my outlines tend to be filled with jargon and stuff that makes sense to me, uh, so I don't usually let anybody else read them, but I find what really helps me is if you find, I use my wife, my dad, anybody that's willing to listen, I'll say, hey, I got this idea for a new story, and I'll tell them the story, and every time I do that, I get more detail, I get, it gets more clear, I don't know why, but for some reason, speaking it out loud focuses, uh, and at least for me, and you, your mileage, mileage may vary, but I find it very helpful. I actually have alpha readers that, they read the book before it even goes to my editor, and I show them my scribbles, count as my outline, and they find holes or things that aren't going to make sense or like they'll help me figure out what spells should they should kill each other with or whatever. So they help a lot. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that organizational theory that you uh, about earlier? The mice quotient? Um, it, it was originated by Orson Scott Card. Uh, it's in uh, Character and Viewpoint. Um, I teach it slightly differently than he does. Uh, if you go to writing excuses and you search for mice quotient, it will come up. And I have an infographic that goes through the, the different points. Okay, one more minute. Any questions? How about, really quick, does anyone have any apps that they use that they just love when they outline? I have a notebook and a pen. Yeah, I, I do my own outlining thing, but I study the Dramatica method, which is really complex, but it's great if you want to understand character. Uh, Dramatica.com, it's written by college professors and reads like it's written by college professors. <laughs> uh, I, I tend to do my outlining and brainstorming on pen and, with pen and paper. There, I, I draft electronically. Sometimes I'll handwrite a few, a few scenes, depending on um, some of the availability of my laptop. But I find for me there's something really gratifying about drawing all over the page and not staying within the lines and, and writing things down and drawing arrows and circling things and moving stuff around and, and writing in the margins as a way to just like get all the information out of my head at the first, the first blush. So I'm total pen and paper at the beginning. I don't like Scrivener for writing. I love it for outlining. All, all my outlines are done in it exclusively. I also outline in Scrivener, but I, I like it for writing. I also love uh, an app called ForTheWords.com, 
which is a role-playing game in which the method by which you defeat monsters is the number of words you write and the, the speed with which you write them. The number four, the words. If you want my referral code, I will happily give it to you. <laughs> okay, and I think we're out of time, so thank you so much.